Hi, everyone. Welcome to Court Chatter Live. I am so excited about today's show. We are blessed to have a special guest with us today. We have author Paul Sanders with us. He has written two books and working on his third book that has to do with trials that we have all followed and watched. Um, so many of you trial watchers um, know exactly who he is. And before I bring him on, um, I'm just going to apologize up front. I have been really sick for a couple weeks and I'm on the mend, but I have this cough that will not go away. And I just know I'm going to break out into a coughing fit in the middle of the show. <laughs> so when I do, I'm going to mute my mic and Paul's just going to talk away, which is okay because that's who you're here to hear from anyway. So I am going to um, bring Paul on. We won't be on screen at the same time, but I'll be asking him questions and you'll hear me off the screen while I have him on the screen. Um, but I'm going to actually let him tell you the background of how he got in to um, watching trials and why he is writing books about them now. So let me bring him on. There he is. Hi, Paul. Welcome to Court Chatter Live. Hi. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, so you are known on Twitter as at the 13th juror MD, and that leads us to why you do what you do now. Oh, there's your phone going off. The name of your Twitter handle is, is exactly why you're doing what you're doing. So tell us, tell us about that. Um, it was, let's see, in October of 2013, I had received a jury notice. I was supposed to go October 23rd. And the week that I was supposed to go, uh, something had come up. So I called the courthouse and I'm like, oh my God, something come up, came up. Can I maybe, instead of doing it on Thursday, October 23rd, can I do this on Friday? Can I do it the next day? They're like, no, 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 it's a three month delay. So I returned on January 23rd and that's when I walked into uh, the jury commissioner's office and there were easily a thousand people there. And uh, I walk in, I sit down, okay, I answer my notice, what do I do? You know, what do I do for a living? Who am I? So on and fill out the paperwork and I sit down and I start doing my taxes. I kid you not. <laughs> <laughs> sitting on the because I've been called before and every time I'm called nothing happens I stand around for eight hours and I'm like you know what this time I am gonna attack this and uh, I'm not gonna waste the whole day damn it so I go in and uh, about an hour into it next thing you know I'm I'm following all these people up these stairs and I walk into a courtroom and uh, one of the first people I see who I thought was an attorney was Marissa DeVault and by the end of jury selection, which was uh, three rounds of 300 people, I ended up one of the final 16. So on the final day of, of jury selection, we thought there were only going to be, you know, 30, 40 people left. We walk in, it's a full courtroom, and they're picking 16 jurors out of like, I don't know, 150, 200 people. And uh, so they're counting them off. Juror number one, you are juror number one. And uh, they get to juror 12 and it was like a number 96, you are juror 12. And at that moment, I'm like, okay, that's it. I'm not going to be a juror. You know, it was interesting to think about because mind you, when you get a jury notice, this stuff comes out of the blue. And uh, next, the next number they call is B198 and I ended up juror 13. Well, I go th through the trial and Every day I come home and uh, because you can't talk to anybody, I, I took notes every night. Every night I just sit down, whatever I can think of, what happened today, because this whole process began with, I don't want to miss anything. And since you can't talk to other jurors or people or look on the news, I literally seceded myself from anything social media, anything news, anything radio, anything newspaper. But I had to get this energy out. So every night I'd come home and write. And uh, we get to the end of the trial and they get to the alternate selection and, and um, somehow I made it through the alternates. Juror number 13 ends up on one of the final 12. And it, it, the deliberation process literally changed my life. 
um, not only the the involvement with the other 12, I found it fascinating. I really thought the whole process was fascinating. Every day I look forward to going in, um, worried primarily about the victim, but but also it, it was just interesting. And it does happen to a, a few of us jurors out there. It happens to. So I end up juror number 13. And then when I was finally able to get out in the social media world, I noticed is that people who had been prior jurors were putting the initials of the person they were a jury, the defendant, behind their name. And hence, uh, the 13th juror, MD, MD stands for Marissa DeVault. Okay, so Marissa DeVault uh, killed her husband. This is in, in Arizona, and I'm going to... Um, and then she was convicted of... She killed her husband by beating him to death with a hammer. And uh, you guys convicted her of first degree murder. I am going to share this with everyone right here. And you wrote a book called, see that should be coming up right now. I don't know if everyone can see that right now. Can everyone see this right here? Oh, there it is. Okay. She wrote a book, uh, you wrote a book called Brain Damage, A Juror's Tell, The Hammer Killing Trial. And there you are by Paul Sanders. And you can get that um, on Amazon, right? You could get it on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble, ebook. Uh, it's all over the place. Yes. Okay. And then she was up for the death penalty, and you guys did not give her uh, death. You want to? You want to say real quick what what that decision was about? Yeah. It was. It was. Uh, you know, it's funny with Arizona or with this capital murder case. It's three phases. Three phases, and in the first two phases, all twelve of us were like best friends. We ate lunch together. We talked together. We had a great time. When we hit the third phase, it became, it was a polarizing event with the jury. We originally walked back as, uh, as with every verdict, before we got there, you do that original jury poll. Our jury split every time before we actually went in the deliberations. And, and uh, the setup, there were, there were two made, there were three influences. The first was that in the death penalty qualifiers, we had reached on the fact that it was cruel and heinous. It was a hammer for crying out loud. But the second question was, what, had this been done for pecuniary reasons, which are financial reasons? And our jury hung on that. And, and at the end of the day, the prosecution did not, did not meet the standard that we needed to meet to get to that. We only needed one qualifier to get to the death penalty. And so we got the one out of two, but the kids were the second factor. The defense put up all the kids and, you know, from 18 years old and then down to Lord, I think the last girl was like eight. It was awful. It was as a jury, it was horrible. It was. And, and we were mad at the defense for doing that. We just, it just seemed unfair. We didn't need to see or hear from the kids. It was awful because it, that burden of responsibility now became not to the state. And what the law says, it drew on the empathy factor that we're not allowed to consider. But it was an impact. Even though it made us mad, it was an impact. But the third area was... Uh, when we got into the sexual abuse of Marissa when she was 12 years old. And we ultimately had to admit, uh, individually and collectively, that it did have an influence on her, not her future actions, but her future character, and, and really had society set her up to be a successful person or not. And so it's, the, these are the, the, uh, you, you split hairs when you get into that. And the thing is, it's, it's when you get an emotion and you get into uh, qualifiers, these are things you can't quantify by numbers. You have to go by gut feelings. So at the end of the day, we ended up giving her life. All right. This brings us to some first questions from our chat room for you. House Mouse says, what kind of woman can kill a man with a hammer? Was he asleep? Yeah, that's just horrific. He 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 was asleep, and she had she had gone through efforts to stage the scene. Um, one of the things being a tissue found in the in the trash can that she used to wipe herself after they had had sex two hours prior. 
Um, and then she went in the garage, smoked a bunch of cigarettes and, and waited till he was asleep before she attacked. She also premeditated the fact that, uh, a gun would be on the person of her roommate, Stanley. So she had set him up to say that Dale was raping her, which none of it was true, but set up the roommate to say, uh, please come in and save me. If this happens again, here's a gun you can use to protect me. And what was supposed to happen was he was supposed to come running in and shoot Dale. He didn't. So she proceeded with the hammer killing. It was awful. Just horrific. That is such a, that is such a horrible way to kill somebody. Okay. Now I'm not really sure about this next question. Her name, uh, Jan says, Jan John says her name was Reese cup. Wasn't it? <laughs> this always makes me laugh. Um, <laughs> Yeah, actually, and it, it was my question that that brought this out to the out to the uh, open court in Arizona. You're allowed to ask juror questions at the end of end of uh, every witness testimony, which is something I didn't get in Washington. Un you know, unfortunately, it gives you an eye of what's going on with the jury. But when it came to ask questions of Travis Tatro, her uh, she had asked him to be an accomplice when he was up on the stand. He was a, uh, bouncer for a strip club bar called knockers in Gilbert. I remember and, that. Uh, yeah, it was funny. I'm like, what I need discovery went crazy. They kept using me on the commercial cuts and she worked for <laughs> knockers. So anyway, but we, when those two had met, we were not clear as a jury, what did she do there? So I just asked, my question was simple. It said, were you a server there, a bartender, or were you, or was she entertainment there? And uh, he, no fear of words, let me tell you. And the, the prosecution had warned us that this guy's a character. And this guy's like, oh my God, she was a blah, blah, blah stripper. And, uh, and her name was Reese Cup. And it just, if you could have seen the defense team's faces when, uh, when that came out, it was, it was a good question. But yeah, her name was Reese Cup on the stage. She had, uh, she had stripped in 2002, then had gone back to stripping later. And, uh, and so the story unfolded. <laughs> okay. Um, Dells wants to know, did her histrionics impact anyone on the jury? Histrionics, explain. Well, uh, did she, uh, did she, you know, play the part of abused woman or, you know? Uh, that was her contention. Um, and it was brought up by the defense a, a number of times. Oh, she got pushed into a wall. Oh, Dale, you know, slapped her. And then, you, you know, and then we found out later that when he slapped her, wasn't slapping her. She had played a joke on him. He returned the joke in kind and she somehow turned that into abuse. Dale's there was, saying her impact statement. Oh, her impact statement. What a twisted mess that was. <laughs> I, uh, it, it, you know, as a jury, you're asked collectively to make decisions and individually. So, you know, when we were in the process of impact sta statements, we were not allowed to talk to the other jurors. So you, you really had to make your own determination. Was it real or was it not real? And I was taken in. I thought it was real. I thought her tears were genuine. She cried. She looked around her and it was this, you know, spiral of emotion that she had. If she could play the tape again, you know, she would she would never have done this. And oh, my God, I caused all this. I was taken in by it, you know, and and uh, and I regret it. But but I was taken in by it. Hey, that, that you know, makes me have a question. Were the women on the jury Wait. taken in by it? No, the <laughs> women, the women were harsh on the jury. They were, they were harsh on Rhiannon. They really were. I loved Rhiannon, but I'll, I'll tell you this. The four person on the jury was like, no, it's an act. I'll tell you right now. It's an act. Women do know women. Goodness, they really God. do a lot more than men. Um, a lot more than men. But so I was taken in by this statement of allocution and then, 
you know, as a jury, the women didn't believe it. Eventually, you know, you put it on the back burner. You're like, you know what? Maybe it really wasn't real. And then you discard it as as lacking credibility. But when we came back for sentencing and then she was called down, she was sitting alone in the jury box. And then they uh, Judge Steinle calls her down to, you know, make her her statement allocution to the judge himself. And she looks and as she's walking down the steps, she's looking at her family and she's smiling and oh, and such empathy for them. And I'm so sorry I did this. She gets in front of the judge. She says, OK, go ahead and speak. And she turned on her statement allocution face. It, it just it clicked. It was like a switch. And it occurred to me then that, oh, my God, she had five years to rehearse mm -hmm. that statement. So, so in the end, I wasn't taken by it, but uh, I feel bad for a moment that it was. <laughs> okay. Lynn wants to know if the psychiatrist testified for the defense. We had a we had a number of psychiatrists. We we got to experience uh, days and days of Dr. Carp. Uh, oh, let me Carp. tell you, that was yeah, that was oh, not a fun experience. Too. Yeah, and it, and it's funny. It ended up kind of important. We had Dr. Carp, Dr. King, and Dr. Wedsdale. Wedsdale was English accent, so we. We had to go through each of these, the training and in psychological makeups and histories and everything like that. But Dr. Carp was absolute torture. You know, we couldn't talk to the other jurors, but Let me just interrupt funny that really quick and tell everybody that Dr. Carp also interviewed Jody Arias and then she was never used at trial. So there's the connection there. Yeah, and and as I was going to say regarding that connection was Juan Martinez was sitting in in the uh in the in the courtroom throughout all of her proceedings all of them and we we talked about that when we went back to the jury room because uh jody arias was a part of us when we were selected during voir dire we were asked multiple questions on arias had we seen the movie had we seen uh what do we know about her testimony what do we know about her her deal on the stand so and this uh, was a, interesting. a year after arias's first trial right this would have been uh, actually six months after Arias and then six months before. It was right in between the two Arias trials. Okay, let's let's move on since we still have we have a lot to get to. Um, I would like to move move on to how I met you. So Debalt ends and you write the first fabulous book, and then the Jody Arias retrial of the penalty phase starts and then you decide that you're going to attend every day of that retrial and write a second book and you go to every day of that retrial and I show up at the end of that and I have a little cute picture of us that I will pull up here to prove to everyone that we know each other. That was fun finally meeting you. That was yeah. fun finally meeting you. Okay. Yep, yep, oh, I remember that day. Look, and he is so tall, let me just tell you. Paul is tall. So there we are outside the Maricopa County Courthouse. I was only there for two weeks. I was there for closing arg arguments and then the, the painful verdict watch. But Paul was there every single day of that. Okay, let me get that out of here. Okay. Yeah, what a journey that was. So, um, you were there every single day, and then you wrote, and I'm definitely going to pull this up because everybody needs to go get this. And I feel bad. I'm awful at marketing. Awful. I, I well, like to write the book, finish. So, so. Okay. Why not kill her? A juror's perspective, the Jody Arias death penalty retrial. So talk to me about the title of that book. Why not kill her? It, uh, oh, good, good question. That actually, it, it, when I wrote Brain Damage, I almost, or when I decided to write it, which was uh, shortly after the trial, that the title came easily. And if you read the book, you know, it, it connects to a, a lot of things in there why not kill her as I'm going through it? I'm like, what, 
what will the title be? It was not until chapter 45, which would have been the defense's closing arguments, that Kirk Nurmi at the very end looks at the jury, looks at the defendant, and he says something to the effect of, do you really want to kill her? And, or do you really want to kill Travis's girlfriend? And I thought it was a low blow. And I, and I remember I came home. I, it took me hours to come up with the title of that perspective that night. And finally, I just it came out of the blue. I was like, why not kill her? And it stuck. And, and that really was the, the principal question in all this. It was a death penalty trial. It was she clearly, in, in public opinion, um, deserved it. And I had always said throughout my perspectives that if and and I think even Juan Martinez said it was that the death penalty was created for people like her. So out came why not kill her? Which is a segue to I'm thinking on the Carnation Murder Trial. I think this book is going to be called the Carnation Murder Trial 2.0. And then in the little handwriting that I like to do, it's going to say, quote, um, banquet of consequences, unquote. I kind of like that title. What do you think? Banquet of consequences. I kind of like it. I kind of like it. So let your readers tell me. Let your readers tell me. Well, I like it, of course. But I like it. I, I like it. You're you're so great with words. So let's do that. That's a good segue to let's let's move on to what we're, we want to talk about really today. Although all right. that they all love what we've talked about so far. They uh, I didn't realize they were going to really want to talk about Marissa Duvall. I thought that was old news, but they were really wanting to talk about that. All right, Michelle Anderson, Carnation Murders. Let's just give a, a brief in here. I'll give a brief overview. So uh, we talked about it a couple weeks ago on Court Chatter Live when the trial was going. This is in Washington State. Michelle Anderson and her boyfriend, Joseph McEnroe, and now we can say they're not just accused. They were both convicted of killing um, Michelle's mother and father, her brother and sister-in-law, and her niece and nephew, who were only five and three years old. Uh, prosecutors say the motive was basically money that... Michelle and Joe were living in a trailer on her parents' property, and they've been living there for free. And her parents have started saying they needed to start paying rent, and that Michelle was under some delusion that her brother owed her forty thousand dollars. Come on, where does she have forty thousand dollars to give him? Um, and that her parents weren't backing her and trying to get him to pay her back. And it was on Christmas Eve that she slaughtered yeah. her family. And it was in a horrible fashion. And Joe's trial was last year and he was convicted. And they had gone for the death penalty on him and the jury failed to give the death penalty. He was given life in prison. And so they dropped the death penalty before Michelle's trial. She was convicted last week. Paul, after the Jody Arias retrial, moved to Seattle. And he's now living in yeah. Seattle and he attended the Anderson trial and he's now writing a book. And that is what we're gonna talk about today. So. Here you are, Paul. Tell me about the move to Seattle. What was that about? That uh, when I finished, when I finished, why not kill her? Actually, I, I'm gonna jump back a story. It goes back to brain damage. But I, I was working for a restaurant when I got selected as a juror, and I communicated the whole thing. And and here's what's going on. You know, here's my official paperwork. Told my boss. Told the regional boss. Uh, and I told him right away, I said, it's going to affect my availability. And uh, I got selected as a juror, told him everything. Here's what I need for my schedule. And the first weekend I come to work while being a juror, they schedule me 40 hours in a weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I'm like, you can't do that. I, I can't walk into a jury box all tired. Y you know, come on, give me a break. So I said, here's what I need for the schedule for me to be effective as a juror. And then, I, you know, keep my job at work. Here's what I need. So I came into work and I was fired. As simple as that. I it didn't have a job anymore. So that required the judge to call my boss at that company and say, you can't do that. So for the next year, uh, my boss held it under, it bothered him that a judge would call him about my schedule. And I was in the middle of the areas trial exactly one year later on January 23rd. And uh, 
And I was put into a position where I was forced to quit because he said, look, you're not a juror anymore. I can schedule you what I want. And I said, look, you know, I'm doing a book on this trial. You know, I'm going here every day. I've been going for two months straight. And I uh, said, it's either, either the job or that. You're not a juror anymore. And uh, so I was forced to quit. So I finished the trial. Then, you know, the three, four months, it goes into rewrite, rewrite, rewrite of the book. And I was out of money and I couldn't find a job could not find a job to save my life. And, uh, you know, I'm a small guy. I don't have a, you know, big publishing contract like Juan Martinez and so on and so forth. Nothing against Juan. Congratulations, Juan. But when you're the little guy out there, which is what I am, it's a challenge. You got to pay the bills. So it came to a point where I had to make a decision to move. And I'm grateful for the help Kathy Brown gave, the help that Mark Milkey gave, all the people who jumped in to help basically sell all my stuff. And in that process, I had also put a note on Facebook saying, look, uh, I've got to move because I couldn't pay rent. I've got to move, but it doesn't have to be in Phoenix. And I got nationwide I a thousand messages. Why don't you move to New York, Boston, Washington, this and that. And it just the way it came together, my old boss from the old job I used to work at, he was working for another company and he had always said, my door is always open if you ever need a job, whatever. Well, he offered his door, a place to live. I am eternally grateful. Jen from T Trial Diaries had mentioned, uh, oh, Washington's got this carnation thing coming up. And What's funny about it is I'm like, if I move, the state has to have the death penalty. <laughs> it, it, it has to have a job and it has to give me a place to live. And that's what Washington did all in one fell swoop. So that's how I ended up at the Carnation murder trial. And ironically, when I moved up here, I was living in Monroe for the first four months, which is where Erica and Scott were from. Isn't wow. that something? Wow. Yep. So we, we crossed the same paths. Wow. So now we're definitely going to need some more trials up there for you. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> I, I've got a couple on the list because now that I don't have uh, encumbered by personal possessions, um, if it means I got to move somewhere else in, <laughs> you know, in June, then I'll do it. But there's a, there's a couple coming up. There's the Alturas murder trial, the mass, the mass shooting. Um, by one of the family members to, to be involved with that. And it, sounds extremely it's a very sad story as well uh so i'm considering that and that will maybe land in june or july that uh another like stay but that may be a year from now because he journeys this month and then uh finally robert durst so there's a couple of interesting ones around the corner uh, i will hope robert durst lives long enough so we can see that one right okay let me just say, um, Susan M says, please thank Paul for his incredible accounts of each day of the trial. His descriptive narration brought us there when we couldn't watch it live. We really looked forward to his daily writings. And let me just ditto that because when they decided not to live stream that every day um, and they weren't writing about it, nobody was writing about it. So you did take us there every day and um and you're so descriptive and that is why also we can't wait for the book so everybody needs Thank to you. buy this book when you come out okay let me jump into a couple of things here first let's put up a picture so we know who we are talking about here okay so there's lovely michelle anderson not that we want to look at her too long. All right. So she was convicted last week. So one thing that we talked about briefly, you and I, before we came on was this. And they ended up not showing us, and I was so bummed, but they recreated the crime scene with the actual furniture inside the courtroom. And they decided not to show us because... It was going to, um, there was too, the jury was too close to it and they were afraid they were going to show them. Okay, so that's up on the screen, Paul. So why don't you tell us about that wow. one? Wow. Wow. And I'll leave it up. This was something oh, else. All right. Yeah, definitely leave it up. Um, what you're looking at is a recreation of the living room, which is where the four principal events happen. If you look to the top left of your screen, see that little table there and those chairs behind it? 
that is where Michelle Anderson and her attorney sat. And then off screen, you'll see the left is where the prosecution sat. On the back wall, you're going to see this huge flow chart. And th on, uh, this was unbelievable. If you look at the floor, that floor is a tarp and it was built with thousands of inch by inch photographs. And these photographs were all put back together, recreated on the car on the uh, on that tarp. So it's not real blood you're looking at. It's not actual biological evidence. And then you see an easy chair there, which was important because one blood drip was found on that. And that blood was from Wayne Anderson. So in that spot where I said where Michelle was sitting watching her own recreation, um, that's where the dining room would have been. But it was from that blood that was how they figured out how how Wayne was executed. And this murder was split in two halves. The, the first part was when Wayne and Judith were killed. And then there began the, the process of killing the next four members of her family. So the easy chair became important. Uh, in the center, you see that coffee table it was filled with planters peanuts. It had open candies for Christmas. This was Christmas Eve. She, Judith Anderson had a roast in the oven, so you, you don't see the smell up there, but she had a roast going in the oven. Um, they were getting ready to put together side dishes. She was in the room if where you're looking at the screen, that would be the hallway to your right. You'd see a Christmas tree to the right. You would see a craft room, which is where Judith Anderson was wrapping presents for Nathan, specifically a, a big toy truck. And years old, right? Yes. Oh my God, how sad. Yeah. And Wayne gets shot. She comes running out. She is then executed to the left of the dining room, just off screen in the kitchen. She's shot at three times. And then this scene right here, the the two killers, McEnroe and Anderson, went through, cleaned up the whole place. There was no blood in the living room. And Erica and the kids came over, you know, presents in hand, Merry Christmas, great to see the family. They walk in and one of the first questions was, where in the heck is, is where are our parents? And Michelle said, oh, they're in the bathroom, they'll be right out. So all of them sit in the dining room. The furthest couch away is where Erica and the two kids were sitting and playing with their stuff. Um, and then Michelle was sitting on the couch right there, that far orange pillow, she was sitting right there. And then next to her was sitting Scott. So they're all waiting for the family to come out. The treats are on the coffee table. We're going to celebrate Christmas tonight. It's around five o'clock at night. The sun has already gone down. And, and uh, Michelle starts an argument with Scott sitting next to her. And then from the viewpoint of where this photo was taken, that is where McEnroe was standing. And then uh, this is when Scott got shot. And then Scott comes forward, falls on the floor. Michelle, uh, and what you had, and then Michelle pulls out her gun. And what you had were two people with guns and then the three people trapped by the couch. It was horrible. And in that process, uh, somehow Michelle got a hold of the 357. There was a gun switch. Uh, but McEnroe had shot the kids. Michelle shot Erica at least twice. Um, it was horrific. So oh, the blood staining and, and blood spatter analysis and, and trajectory rods, that TV behind there, you're going to see a bullet in the TV. That was one of the bullets that Anderson had fired, I think, at, at Erica and had missed and had gone through the TV. Um, but it, it it was amazing that without any evidence really from this live field confession, that they were able to take that scene and reconstruct it moment by moment. So that flow chart on the wall, death uh, is the process of death for each victim. It was it was fascinating. Uh, it, oh, it's so so hor uh, so horrifying. This this these these set of pictures. Um, this makes me angry, and I want to talk about it a little bit. Let me get this up here right here. We saw a lot of this. 
we saw a lot of her covering her face with her long greasy hair okay we saw this with jody arias we saw this with casey anthony and interesting you and i were talking before the show and you said marissa devault did this with she her did hair. Yeah. Yes. And i find that very interesting with these women and they get to court and they hide behind their long hair and it, like don't look at me or I didn't do it or now I'm I'm too ashamed and I'm not gonna show my face or whatever is the psychology behind that um, I have another one of her and she did this every time she walked out of court that this is what she looked like every single time she walked out of court it's like I almost want there to be some rule where the defendants have to pin their hair back or wear a back in a ponytail so the jury can see their face. It's like stop, stop hiding uh, and, you know, fess up to what you've done or at least look the jury in the eyes. You want to you want to see something funny about that? And this directly here, put that picture up again, if you don't mind. Which this, one? I looked at this, the one you just had up with uh, Anderson walking, being let yeah. out of court. Yeah. You're going to see me in there. If you look up toward the top right, you're going to see me. Oh, let's see. I'm like face the other way, gathering my notes, what have you. The thing is, when you're a juror and you have you have come to that conviction stage, you you're done with that person. You are done with the defendant. Your presumption of innocence is gone. You don't even want to look at that person because, and and that, that's my thing too, is I, I didn't look at Arius when she'd walk out of court. And just like Anderson, I had no- Yeah, you, you, see, know, it's, you see you there looking totally down in a way. Yep, yep, I, I don't care. It doesn't, she's, she's not the story here. The story is the six people that lost their lives on Christmas Eve. The story is that, the two young kids who, who, oh, how bothersome this was when in her confession to Detective Tompkins, she said, oh, and Nathan, he looked, he had peace on his face like he knew what was going to happen. Are you kidding me? Seriously, to minimize it and separate like that, like she had done some service? The look on his face was not that. The look on his face was, what are you doing? You know, it's just unbelievable. So I, I have no respect for some of these defendants after conviction. Okay. I have got a whole bunch of questions about, and I have a picture here. This is what I have the most questions sent to me before the show for you about oh, oh, this okay. person. <laughs> Ugh. Ugh. Remember her? Here, let's pull Yeah. Her. Well, yeah. Pull her down and we'll pull it's, her it. Okay, so hang on. That... Let me read them so I can get the people on right. air here. So, Adele, let's uh, see, wait a minute. Uh, uh, where's my questions? <coughs> Hannah says, the manic lady in court, the Michelle supporter, um, why did she keep making a reference about you? What had you done to upset her? She said your name I, more I, than uh, once. Yeah. Uh, so, interesting scenario, but, you know, you go to court every day and you expect in a in a legal battle like this, that you're going to have a defense team presenting arguments and a prosecution presenting arguments. And all we got was pro uh, prosecution. And early on in my perspectives, I had made a comment when this, when this girl first appeared on the record, I ha had made a comment that, that, oh my God, that's, that's like the antagonist. And this is way back at the beginning of the trial. I think, um, I had made mention of her in an early perspective, and I think I called her heavy, and I, I, I don't know. It's but I think that made her livid, <laughs> <laughs> livid, absolutely livid, and I really only talked to her on the very first day of, day of trial. It's you know I'm. I, I, had, I had done all of jury selection. Nobody was there for jury selection, but the jurors, the prosecution team, defense team, judge, and me. 
Um, and that's where I spent four days in the jury box. Nobody else had been there. So we finally get to the first day of trial. You know, and a couple of people are talking, whispering ahead of time. Time. And she started talking to me and at, at first she seemed nice enough. And then and then I started hearing these things about constitutional violations and so on. And I kind of at that point, I, I kind of shy off from this person. I'm like, uh, that's not really what this trial is about. And I was told by somebody from the court later, they took me inside, took me aside and said, be careful this that just be careful of this person we she's got a background and uh so the rest of the trial and i kid you not the rest of the trial i never said a word to her i come in do my thing grab my notes sit down take my notes and leave never said a word to her yet yet on occasion this person would get up and for whatever reason start speaking to the judge one time the microphone wasn't working right and she just raises her hand like it's high school uh, excuse me judge that microphone's not working like really and i'm floored especially you know i have juror blood in me so that's one thing you don't do is just stand up in the middle of the court and i remember at the conclusion of that day that the judge had said he goes can i have my trial back and I was like, oh my God, how did this girl do this? Well, it continued and, and she kept talking about, oh, I've got an interruptive disorder. I've never heard of this order, but she definitely had it. And uh, <laughs> she, had, she had it out for me. There was a blast to the court to uh, live stream. And, and uh, she found me live in court. She went off on me how I shouldn't and the awful things I was saying about her and this and that. I only mentioned her maybe once in the uh, perspectives, maybe twice. And I don't think uh, the one time I, I used the wrong name and the second time I didn't use her name at all. But she had actually spoken multiple times, multiple times. And just picture you're taking notes at the trial and then somebody is up berating you in front of the court who's not supposed to be talking anyway. And you're taking notes on yourself. It was really weird. <laughs> OK, so I, I texted you during that moment. They were they were live streaming one of the days she stood up and was disrupting in the middle of court. First of all, that never happens, right? And we did see something like that happen during the Casey Anthony trial. And Judge Perry held the woman in contempt of court and threw her in jail, okay? He didn't mess around. That's the only time we've seen something like that happen. Um, so that gets us trial watchers all excited when something like this happens. And so she stands oh. up in the middle of court and starts yelling at the judge from the back of the room. And we can see you right in front of her and your head is just down and she starts saying <laughs> your name. So I text you <laughs> and you, and you write back and you go, I wasn't going to look up. I wasn't going to look back. Nope. I just wanted to nope. fade into the bench. <laughs> I'm like, why do I keep being brought up? And what what had inspired that in the morning? <laughs> they were trying to live stream, and for whatever reason, they couldn't get it going. But uh, Scott O'Toole had finished his his closing statement. It was a powerful. He just what a wonderful job from a complicated murder scene to what he did in closings. It was a phenomenal closing. And at the very end, he finishes, and he he he's walking back to the prosecution table and then suddenly this lady behind me says wow what a great actor like out loud <laughs> out and and the thing is the danger in that is there was a jury present you you right. you don't you don't you just don't so uh, you know uh my thing was I do not want to be, a, this is the victim's family and all those who knew the victims. A trial is, is about justice and it's for them. Right. It, it, yes, it's a right to be able to, that these are, you know, publicly viewed, but there's, there's also a uh, decorum that you need to respect in a, in a courtroom. And this girl did not have it. And then she would lean on this, oh, the ADA and my you. You have to accommodate my interruptive disorder, and right. oh my God, it was it was it was nauseating. I, I don't know any other way to put at it so, right. to put it. And you, um, fight for TA says, um, why didn't the judge 
you know, why did the judge continue to allow her to sit in the gallery? Um, once they knew her name, the court personnel surely looked up and saw that she was a convicted felon. You know, why did why did the judge continue to you know allow her to sit in there? You know, I know that he said that you know he, the pills court, the Supreme Court would get all over him, but you know he's only going to allow so much to happen. Why do you think he was so accommodating to her? Boy, that's a that's a good question. Another flashback to areas. Remember when we all got kicked out of the courtroom yes. and had to sit in a appellate court because Jody's rights superseded the rights of the public and the media. Secret well, this, this kind of played was starting to play that scenario, but I think this, not to the degree that Judge Stevens was, but I, I he was very conscious throughout the trial of the appeal process. His, his primary concern was, um, fairness to the defendant it was it was also fairness to the family and and his concern not just on the appeal but more to the fact that he did not want to see this all get regurgitated again five years from now with another trial and he had said that another you know on a number of occasions he's not gonna have have this trial derailed he did not want this trial to turn into a circus uh, mm -hmm. but I, I, I think there were times this judge felt his hands were tied, tied behind him with the law. So I, I don't know, fault but... him for, for doing what he did, but I do think by the time that third major, this what that was the third major outburst, um, that, that she should have been 86 from the court. She yeah, really that's, that's too have. much. Look, we've, we've been around this a long time and I disagree. You know, after the first time, and I know she said she had some syndrome that I get, he was kind of trying to walk on glass around that. But look, that was the third yeah. time she should have been out. But anyway, okay, let's get to some more. We're almost out of time. Um, Adele wants to know if Michelle was disruptive when the cameras were, weren't on or if the jury was out of the room. Um, and is she as cold as she seems to be? Oh, good, good question, Michelle. Um, Adele. The, Adele, good question, Adele. The the first part of it is, and and you see this with defendants. We saw it with Arias. We saw it with Deval. There's, they have the persona they carry when the jury is there is different than the persona uh, when the jury's not there. And and the case in point was the day of the the reconstructed scene. Uh, you should have seen Michelle look at it all curious and interested and oh and yeah. and even animated even animated like you and i and all the normal people out there if we killed somebody we we wouldn't want to come back and revisit the scene it would be our worst nightmare so you saw this that her type of reaction would not have played well with the jury so she had two personalities um one in front one one away from the jury wow. but the day that she had her outburst yeah um somebody from the court had 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 told me had said if you had seen her eyes those eyes were the same eyes that the victims saw before they were killed wow she yeah there was a coldness to her and and her her um affectation her demeanor her it, it just everything was about michelle everything oh i'm being so hurt oh my constitutional rights you know and and i'll tell you i want to be like that that one lady who could stand up in court and i want did want to get up and say what about the constitutes people you murdered what about the lives you took what about them right you know so it it just uh doesn't make sense to me does not make sense well, then this might answer the next one. Kate Burkhart uh, says, aside from, in her opinion, coming across as sociopathic, does Anderson come across truly mentally ill? For example, her crazy ramblings to the judge. Do, do you think she's truly mentally ill? You and I talked a little bit about this right before. I, um, you know, it's all a moot point because it wasn't, you know, thankfully it wasn't a death penalty trial because if it was a death penalty trial, we'd be, we'd still be in trial right now. We'd still be in trial a month from now because that's the issue we'd, we'd be talking about. But my assessment at the end of the day was she certainly had mental issues. Um, but it, you know, at the same time, it, it, 
takes a certain type of person to in, in kill kill people. So the question is, is there an inherent craziness that's that's part of it? Well, it it is unfortunately, um, but I I don't think in my honest opinion, I she knew what she was doing. She premeditated it, um, and it. it it she, she's not a smart person but mark do you you know a, a dumb person would kill six people so do we know her know. iq do we what do we know her iq we'd know I no uh i was grateful that we that we <laughs> didn't have to go in all that because there could have been arguments there um and those arguments may would probably have hung the jury yeah. I, I'm telling you right now, they probably would have hung the jury. But she had she she had a standard what right wrong, right and wrong was, and just by the premeditation of the act and the covering up of what she did, shows that regardless of mental capacity, she had enough mental capacity to know what she was doing. Well, right, and you know, just from what you said of how she acted when the jury's not around, and when we saw her outbursts. Um, to the judge and stuff, you you know, you can tell she knows right from wrong. And you know what else? What else was telling to me is the jailhouse call between her and that Stephen, I think it's Stephen LePage. Um, they have the recordings out there. We have it on our site. This is after she's arrested. Um, she's trying to get him to get a hold of some newspapers for her or something and get her some money and stuff. She's very manipulative. And she's very like with it. She's very she's she's not dumb and she's not mental and she's trying to manipulate him. And if you listen to that jailhouse call, um, you can see how she manipulated Joseph McEnroe. You can is she to do her bidding. Um, that call to me showed a different side of Michelle Anderson, and she's not crazy. Um, and she, no, you can tell that she totally is very capable of planning things. Okay, a few more she, questions here. Yeah. Um, Lynn wants to know, has Paul talked to Mary Victoria? I, uh, all of this, well, you know, for, for the family certainly was extremely difficult and, and there were family members there every single day. Um, but Mary Victoria was only there one day and it was the day she testified. Is that Michelle's and sister? Yes, it's uh, she was an adopted sister. Wayne and Judy had had made that decision a long time ago, and uh, she she's just a real gem of a person. She reminded me of Suzanne Summers in a lot of ways. Not only in a lot of ways, not only physically how she looked, but in her her character. She's just very soft spoken, very nice, um, and. The one thing you could tell was all of this was extremely painful, her, painful for her. She, no, and I, I, you know, and and consider this too, if she was, she and her son were supposed to be there on Christmas Eve. Uh, they, yeah, that's right. She had, yes, yeah, she had talked to Judy that afternoon, and and then basically called out sick because her son got sick and she didn't want to get the rest of the family sick. That's, right. That's how close she missed death by. She uh, would be dead. So this, sure. yeah, she would be dead. And so too would her, would her son. So, um, it's understandable that she wouldn't come back. Yeah. Okay. Hoagie wants to know, would Paul consider moving to Wisconsin if a Stephen Avery gets another trial? Oh, wouldn't that be interesting? Uh, yeah, this is all, you know, wherever God takes me in a way. It's, 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 it depends. Do that? Yeah, I'd, I'd do that. Uh, I wouldn't be first retrial, would it? Um, but yeah, I do that. And, and the advantage is, it's funny, but the advantage is, uh, I don't know a lot about that case. I, I really don't. This trial was going on, uh, when all that was kind of unfolding. So I don't know a lot about it. And that's the way I'd like to go in the courtroom. Well, so. yeah, making a murder is very one-sided. So, um, I'm not convinced of his innocence or his guilt. So I'm very down the middle on that case. Um, all right, let's see what else. 
Uh, Natalie has a comment. What killed me was when she said the little boy knew um, and was accepting to be killed. Yeah, she's just evil. It's what, what Scott O'Toole had said was it's it's her way of, of minimizing. Yeah, That's right. her way of, of putting her hands over her face and put her head down at the defense table. Oh, poor me. Well, uh, I I do not to this day believe that's what that's what happened. So, um, but I'll keep you posted. There are going to be things in the book that I don't want to mention right now. Oh, good. There are there are some uh, some pieces on there that definitely you didn't see in the trial. So that's going to be one of my opportunities. Good. I'm glad. Okay. I think we got to all the questions. Hey, Paul, I am so happy you did this with us. And I want to just have you on again as like a co-host and just talk about the different cases that are going on because I loved having you on and I can't wait to see what trial you go to next. And definitely I'm going to promote your book when it comes out and uh, keep in touch and let us know what you're going to be doing. Thank you. Absolutely. You all know I'm on Twitter as a 13 juror MD. You can find me on Facebook under Paul Sanders. Um, it was a pleasure being on with you, Kathy. Really something. Our one year anniversary. Remember where we were was a, a year ago? ago? We were in Arizona right. together. Right. Sitting on verdict watch for areas. So, That's But right. uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. I also want to thank uh, uh, Jared Seltzer from Trial Talk Live. I want to thank Jen from Trial Diaries and all those Facebook groups who have uh, supported me. The Seattle Times as well. Thank you very much for supporting me throughout this. Thank you. That's right. Thank you, Paul. Goodbye.